I'd like to do tonight is um, give you an overview of the survey, the completion of the survey, the process that we use to look at the data, where we are with the information, and hopefully we'll have some time to look at it and how it relates to some of the other things going on in the district. Okay, so this is um, the U.S. Department of Ed survey, and we'll talk about that just a little bit more in a bit. Let me see if I can get my... Okay, did you see that move? I'm seeing some funny things here. So speaking of COVID, um, we have a generally a typical process that we use whenever we're involved with some projects or major activities. And I highlighted that for you to there. Um, for example, we would have the project completed with ongoing refinement that we're working on all the time. Nothing's really ever done if we gather in more information or feedback. So in this case, we had the climate survey completion and the data analysis of that. And we completed a summary and recommendations that went before the IAC, some revisions, then back to the IAC. And then that was shared with the superintendent who certainly keeps the board informed on all of that. So then we do our internal sharing with the buildings. In this case, we had our elementary, middle and high schools participate in the survey, elementary, fifth graders, and then six through 12. And that goes back to the buildings when it's in its finalized form, they look at their own data, they develop plans, et cetera, from there. Then we also go out to the larger community, PTSA, various PTSA meetings, et cetera. So in looking at um, how we're doing on this COVID impacted process, I wanted to share with you, we're going about this a little bit differently. So our typical process is, as you see there, yes, we did do the survey and the data analysis. Nope, we did not complete our internal sharing with the buildings. Um, and that is directly related to COVID. And I'll give you an example of this. Mr. Pirro and I had um, a significant amount of time blocked off with the secondary principles. As you'll see, this is um, primarily focused on the secondary buildings and something related to COVID took both of us away from that. So we had to reschedule that. So that will be coming up again very soon. But I didn't want to hold off on coming to uh, share with you as I had promised that we would share that out at one of our IAC meetings. So I wanted to let you know there's a little bit atypical in terms of some of the things that we do. And there might be some questions I can't answer for you because that second piece is not as complete as we'd like it to be. But we will continue on. So why do we do this type of a survey? I get that. I didn't necessarily get that asked of me for this survey, but I very frequently will get that asked of me from the youth risk behavior survey or some other things that we do. And so looking, I always like to drive things back to our vision and our mission. Why we want to have the information as much as possible so that we can link that to what we're doing on a daily basis with our students and what we need to do. Um, to constantly improve and change. And then I also highlighted for you, some of you are very familiar with the Inclusivity Advisory Committee and some are less uh, familiar. So I just highlighted some of the areas that it makes sense that the IAC was going to take a look at this particular survey and review the findings. So these are all important words that we all talk about and believe in in the work that we do. And so we want to make sure to tag those together so that it's driving our work. So we'll talk a little bit about school climate. Uh, school climate can be defined as the overall quality and character of school life. And um, it's comprised of a number of things, including those things that you see there on the screen. Um, when you think back to our own experiences in school, I'm sure there are times that we all recall when we felt safe or unsafe in school, when we were connected to the adults in the school or when we were not connected to the adults in the school, when we were engaged and maybe sometimes not engaged. So those are the kinds of things that stay with us um, in one way or another as, as we go into um, all of our school years and we go beyond our school years. So the good and the bad. <laughs> 
stays with us. And um, these are the memories that we're trying to shape. So we look at school climate though, that's really bigger than any one person's experience. It's a, a process, I'd say a group process that emerges as the bigger piece of the picture in school. Um, and so we do this comprehensive assessment in multiple ways of, of school climate. And we look at things like safety, relationships, teaching and learning, and the environment. Um, we know through the literature and the peer reviewed literature consistently links school climate and overall uh, academic achievement as well as risk prevention and positive development. So there's lots of reasons to spend some time on school climate. So if our students feel safe at school, feel welcomed and treated with respect, they're going to do better. It sounds simple, but it's really intentional work that has to happen in order to realize that. Um, and then the opposite happens too, right? If the school is not um, positive or safe, then we see issues around attendance, underperformance, um, dissatisfaction, et cetera. So we want that focus to be on the positive school climate. And given our current COVID situation, it makes it doubly uh, challenging we were having that conversation before we started around uh, the fact that so much of what individuals and families and communities have done has been restricted and that's very challenging on all of the members of that community, including our kids in school. So some people talk about climate and culture as the same and are we looking at climate or culture or both? Um, there's kind of a comparison of climate and culture uh, our focus for this particular survey is around the climate, um, the norms, values, and expectations that support people feeling socially, emotionally, and physically safe, engaged and respected. We want people to be able to do that in a collaborative way within the school settings. We also want to assure that we're able to model and nurture the growth and development of our students. And that includes all those other components, including the physical environment that, that I mentioned before. So about this survey, um, it's Department of Education, U.S. Department of Education uh, was ministered in April 2019. 68 questions, and I can share a little bit about that later. Uh, electronic and web posted in fifth grade through 12th grade. So we learned some important lessons about um, survey administration with some of our groups through this as well. Here are the areas that it measures. There is a variety under safety, environment, and engagement. We're gonna look a little bit at each of these as well. So I can't see anybody, so if you have questions, someone's gonna to have to flag me down, okay? So who responded to our survey? This gives you a general overview of the students who responded by grade level and by race, ethnicity. And this gives you an overall look at the number of students who responded versus the enrollment at that particular time. So for example, at Menden Center, uh, there was 146 students eligible to participate in the survey and 130 participated. So I'll give you a second to look at that there because I'm sure you'll notice some of the things that we notice as well relative to this particular slide. I'm guessing that you noticed we had a drop off in the participation going from fifth grade. Remember those elementaries are all just fifth graders uh, through, through to Barker and Calkins, which is six through eight to Menon and Sutherland nine through 12. So one of the most important lessons that we learned about the survey and our uh, means of distribution is that 
should we do this survey again, we would change how we distributed the survey to our high school students. In our fifth grades, the students were in a class um, and they were able to take the survey. Same with set, uh, sixth, seventh and eighth grade. So you'll see the percentages of kids who participated is much higher. In the high schools, we gave the students a code to get into the survey and we found that um, looking at that's about 25, 26% of the high school students completed the survey. And there's a difference between the two high schools as well. Elementary was about 80%, middle a little bit over 80%. So when we look at our data, we need to keep that in mind. And that's one of the reasons that if we wanted to really drill down and spend a little bit of time, um, particularly looking at the high school numbers, um, recognizing that when we're looking at the aggregate numbers, there's going to be a significant impact of the other grade levels onto the aggregate numbers. So in terms of the analysis, so we wanted to look at how are students feeling, what's their perceptions around being in a safe school setting, a supported school setting, and belonging in the school setting. So we took a look at the data in a number of different ways looked at the overall domains, um, comparing and contrast them, looking at the school level, et cetera. And there was a lot of data there to <laughs> take a look at. We used a data-driven dialogue process where we um, spent time just looking at the data and recognizing what jumps out at us as individuals and then as groups, trying to identify any patterns or trends that we saw anything that surprised us or that was unexpected. And maybe were there things that we didn't explore? So I go back to the um, number of students at the high school level. Uh, some of us were surprised at that and that obviously led to a recommendation to do it very differently another time. So these are the overall results. I'd like to share with you some overall results and then we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into the high school because that's where the IAC felt that while we recognize and understand the importance of early intervening services and systems that some of the findings at the high school led us to say that we would recommend to the district to spend some uh, more upfront time on the high school level and continuing with the others as well. So this is our aggregate data by domain. So there are domains and elements in this particular survey. We'll get into that just a little bit more as we go further, it'll be a little bit easier to read. Um, but looking at this particular page, uh, the Likert scale is listed there, four, three, two, one. Um, overall, the scores show in the favorable range. And that's the terminology that's used in the survey, favorable or unfavorable and degrees of favorableness and unfavorableness. Um, so if you look at the uh, particular slide there, you, the darker blue would be more favorable. Obviously the red to the darker maroon or dark red would be least favorable. Um, so overall, the way that the scoring is done for this particular survey. While there are highs and lows that we're going to talk about, all of those highs and lows are within the favorable range. So when we looked at that and saw that um, favorability was there, you know, and obviously all of you that are statistically minded will know you have to dig deeper into the data to look at a variety of different things. So we first took a look at a broader stroke to say, well, what were the three or so uh, most favorable at each of the levels and the three or so that were least favorable at each of the levels? So those are outlined here on this particular chart. Um, there are some commonalities that you can see across the levels, elementary, middle, and high and then a couple of differences that you see, um, again, particularly with the high school.
I'll go back to here just a second. Um, as an IAC, if you notice on the bottom where we put letter-based grade equivalents, uh, thinking that in schools, maybe we would also use assign a grade so that we could talk about um, the results in terms of what kind of grade would there be for that particular result. So again, looking at the levels, one of the things we've found overall, and you'll see this in the next couple of slides, overall students have a greater sense or more favorable sense at elementary, and that slowly declines over time to middle and high school. And while we looked and talked about this data, there were many of us that um, were not necessarily surprised because uh, once again, the literature is bearing this out in terms of looking at students going from one level to the other and their perceptions and beliefs around these various topics. So these are the safety elements that were listed there. And let me just give you a sense of some of the questions that would be in the safety elements. So there would be a couple of different sheets here. So the safety elements for emotional safety, that would be things such as I feel I belong, students get along with each other well, I feel like I'm a part of the school, I feel accepted. For physical safety, there are things such as I feel safe going to and from school, um, I sometimes stay home because I don't feel safe, students at this school steal money, electronics or other valuable things, students fight. Those are the types of things in the physical safety. Cyberbullying is uh, students are teased or picked on about their race or ethnicity. Students are teased or picked on about their uh, backgrounds or mental ability and goes through each category. Students are bullied and uh, rumors are spread in the school. So I'm paraphrasing, but those are the types of things that are um, talked about there. In terms of substance abuse, uh, students use alcohol or drugs. It's easy for students to access those. Student thinks, students think it's okay to smoke or drink or use drugs. Um, emergency readiness is students know what to do in an emergency. And if students hear a threat about school or safety, they would report it to someone in authority. So again, I go back to these overall scores are listed in the favorable in terms of this particular survey, but we do see a decline as we go forward. Um, once again, in this particular domain, we see the same decline. Um, and these types of questions are cultural linguistic, our uh, students are treated the same regardless of whether their parents are rich or poor. Uh, boys and girls treated equally, adults treat students respectfully, people of different cultural backgrounds, races, or ethnicities get along well at this school. Relationships is um, both with teachers and with peers. And so, since we're talking about students, it's easy to talk to teachers. My teachers care about me. Students respect one another. Students like one another. If I'm absent, um, somebody notices my absence and you can kind of see some of the overlapping in some of the school, um, the questions. Participation is I regularly attend school events. I participate in extracurricular activities or clubs, etc. Students have chances to help decide things, chances for students to get involved and chances to be part of classroom discussions and activities. And once again, we see that decline as decline as the ages go up and grades go up. Last one is environment. Um, and that is physical environment relates to, there are questions regarding the bathrooms, the temperature, school grounds, uh, whether or not students are proud of how their school looks. And if things get broken, do they get fixed? Instructional environment is being praised when working hard in school, getting individual attention, uh, things are important to me and teachers' expectations 
to do my best. Environment, the one that's related to mental health. There are questions such as uh, teachers care about me. I can talk to my teachers about a problem. I can talk to other adults. Students at this school stop and think before doing anything when they get angry. And students try to work out their own problems or disagreements. And lastly is discipline. Um, this relates to making, it, is there clarity around behavior, adults um, rewarding students for positive behavior, uh, helping students develop strategies, uh, school rules are applied equally and discipline, the fairness of discipline. So those are the kind of the thumbnail sketch of, of all the categories. So I guess I, what I wanted to share with you there is that um, we recognize that all of the uh, areas show a change over time. And the IAC took quite a bit of time talking about this and looking at this from a developmental perspective, from um, a local community perspective, from all kinds of ways. And we really honed in on our high school students and wanting to spend more time focusing in on the high school students for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. And then I don't know if Tiffany is in the audience tonight, so I will thank her and give her a shout out for her recommendation for me to look at the data in this way. So I am going to focus a little bit more on high school tonight and share that information with you. So we try to take a look at um, all of these domains and elements uh, related to, uh, in this case, the high schools and look at the various um, ways that our children, that we could parse out the data that our kids have answered the question. So in this particular survey, there was limited, and this is a perfect example, and it relates, I think, at least to what you were talking about earlier. The IASA looked at this survey and another survey, and while there's discussion at the state level department about whether or not this will be a requirement for schools to look at some of their benchmark data to report to the state, we chose to use it but we added additional questions so that we could get some more information from our students in terms of their gender and sexual orientation, their race and ethnicity that were asked in different ways or limited ways on the survey. So we added additional questions to the survey. We also asked students um, to identify their religion, et cetera. So you'll see a few of these here that are not necessarily part of the original survey, but we had the capacity to add them and then we could do the data analysis on those particular items as well. So I share that with you as we start looking at this from the high school level. So here's the data. Remember uh, 3.0 is like that um, B. Uh, goes to 3.09, I think it says there, it's covered on my screen, but um, so we tried to color code these so to give us a sense of where the highs and lower scores are while all of them remain in the C and above according to the grades that we, we did a parallel with the 4321. So I'm going to share this with you and you know Mark and Thada, I don't know how you want to do this. You want to talk about questions now or you want to go through and then come back. I'm open to either but I wanted to make sure to get this way that we looked at the data more recently um, out there for discussion. And it's a nice visual. And again, I'll thank Tiffany for that recommendation. Um, oh, yes. Sorry, if people have questions, you guys could post them in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the end, we can kind of just go through all the questions. Um, right. And then we can certainly, you know, come back to a particular slide if you've right. got a question around the slide. So here, are obviously, some things to notice here, and you know, all of us look first to that red and pink, so that we know that um, we see some things related to emotional safety and bullying, and mental health and discipline. Uh, so again, this is high school combined high schools. We also looked at um, the domain and elements related to race. So along the left-hand side, you should see all of those are the same. 
we've listed all the domains and elements there. And then the right-hand side will be the various components of our students. So here we saw some strengths. So the yellow will pop out to you. And then also some lower areas in terms of um, cyberbullying and bullying and substance abuse. Um, in terms of sexual orientation, here are some things that jump out at us. Again, that pinkish and red would be the areas of concern and the darker, the blue or into yellow are more favorable. Um, by religion. That's a lot to take in visually, I know, but um, we can always come back to these. Um, we also looked at our students by um, ELL, which is English language learners. They're in our English as a new language program or non-ELL and our students with disabilities and students who do not have disabilities. So our overall findings across the levels, so this is um, the five to 12 findings. The areas of strength, um, and this is what the superintendent asked the IAC to do is to identify those areas of strength and the areas of an, needing an improvement and if there were any suggestions regarding those. So those were the areas of strength across the district five to 12. Um, physical safety, student to teacher and adult relationships. And I point that out because it's very significant in terms of looking at um, how we might be able to address some of the areas that came up as less favorable. And then uh, the better news that there's resistance to substance use among our elementary and middle school students. And we'll find that that's not the same for our high school students. Areas of need of improvement. There are some commonalities around mental health supports and services, uh, bullying and cyberbullying, and some things around the physical environment, the physical plant. So digging just a little bit differently, this is elementary. And again, I think I'll, if I do this again, I'll make sure that it says fifth grade because we're really talking about the fifth grade students here. Uh, the strengths are common in this area. We added cultural and linguistic competence. Uh, areas in need of improvement is uh, mental health, physical, and school participation. Middle school, the, um, some of the same ones, again, again, the student-teacher-adult relationships, uh, cultural linguistic, um, there's mental health, bullying, cyberbullying, again, and some physical environment things. Middle school. High school, uh, strengths, again, were interesting and parallel to some of the others, the physical safety and student to teacher or adult relationships and school participation. And areas in need of improvement uh, included the others that we'd seen, but also peer relationships and discipline, uh, as well as the others that we had on there. So I, I, in looking at our high schoolers, this is important for us because what jumped out, even when we looked at uh, individual questions and we really took many deep dives into the data, the fact that we had um, very strong student to teacher or student adult relationships, but the peer to peer relationships were weaker. And interestingly, enough, we're seeing some of the work that we focused on in terms of uh, working with our students to identify trusted adults. Now, I can't tell you there's a direct correlation there, but that's been something over the past couple of several years that we've been working on in terms of intentionally looking at um, 
resiliency and mental health development. Also, um, the school participation was interesting, the school participation. So what we found that for our high school students, they participated, now this is gonna be a generalization, but I'll share it there. They participated in activities, clubs, et cetera, when they were a member, but not necessarily attending other school events where they would be an observer or an audience member or something like that. So there was that difference between a lot of participation or a lot of opportunities for to participate versus participating as um, part of the school community, if that makes sense. So we saw that, that subtle difference and have that in our heads related to the peer relationships, right? So maybe there are some things there that um, we can be working on to build those peer relationships um, and encourage kids to be part of the greater whole, not necessarily just the items that they're involved in, which are certainly important to participate in. And as we uh, talk those through on uh, several occasions and try to look at, well, what would we recommend, again, in particular to the high schools at this point in time regarding our findings? Um, so what would we say to them? As a, from our committee, after looking at this data, parsing it out, dicing it and slicing it in multiple ways, what would we say to them? I'll share with you also, we took a look at the Youth Risk Behavior Survey and the elements of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey that may parallel some of the questions or categories, um, while they're not exactly the same, but they parallel these types of questions and circumstances. And we did find that they were consistent uh, in the findings of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey and the uh, Climate Survey, and particularly in relationship to um, substance use for our high school students, which was a major concern out of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. So we came up with some recommendations we thought that the buildings and the levels could spend time uh, looking at these results for uh, an understanding of the strengths and the needs areas, and then really put together a process to address individual building needs, but also the needs of the levels. We thought they were certainly highs and lows for each location, but overall, the findings were pretty consistent across the levels and um, very often our levels work together. The high school principals work together and counselors work together in middle school, et cetera. So that's how we drew our recommendations. So the first recommendation we had was to really support and strengthen those student to student relationships that we uh, felt it came through in multiple ways that while the student to the adult relationships were very favorable and that's also important in school, it's important to have that student to student relationship so that the sense of belonging, understanding how to address conflict, understanding each other, uh, respectful of differences, et cetera, so that students have an overall better uh, feeling of belonging and in the school setting. So we are recommending that. We gave some examples of things that may or may not certainly be appropriate for the uh, principals and buildings to share, but we provided examples and resources for them to review and look at in order to uh, build those plans within their buildings, in addition to the things that they're already working on. But I think this gives a little punctuation to some of the things that as a building leader, you have a sense of what's happening in your building or as a counseling or mental health team, you have a sense of what's going on in your building. And I think this gives some additional evidence to uh, continue and enhance the work. Uh, we also talked a lot about 
utilizing the strength of that student to adult relationship to facilitate positive peer relationships. And there are ways to uh, build upon what exists in terms of students and teachers to really uh, help to build that normative culture around peer relationships to have that modeling of the adults in dealing with situations so that students will learn those skills as well as direct and intentional activities. You'll see some of the professional development type things that we've listed as recommendations um, that are certainly underway and in process and uh, some may be new, but most are somehow in process. And it also kind of uh, helps us to say, let's look at what is in existence and do we need to do more of or what might be missing. The third recommendation is um, really supporting and strengthening <clears throat> skills to create culturally responsive, sustaining environments. And looking again at examples of ways to do that is um, through professional development, really having some brave conversations or courageous conversations, as they're called, looking at curriculum, looking at our um, materials, et cetera, and continuing some of the work with the Generation Ready that was uh, begun and held off for a bit with COVID, but is back. And we're excited about that. The fourth recommendation is really extending that to our community, encouraging parents and families to do the same. And I'm sure many of you are on the 21 day challenge, um, which is a wonderful community event that helps us inside our organization, and I'm sure your organizations, as well as in our homes and family lives and making sure that we are working closely with PTSA. So again, I thank you for having me tonight and um, providing some of those opportunities and supporting each other in that type of work. The fifth recommendation was, um, it's really a communication recommendation, right? So how do we sustain communication around these important elements and make sure that we have some kind of ongoing uh, way to hear from students and families and staff to better understand the needs that are there and looking at, you know, do we do this survey again, right? So that's another feedback mechanism. Are we able to do this again? Look at the data. The um, U.S. Department of Ed has enhanced and made more robust their processes. So I think it would be um, a faster process for us. And with some of the things we did put together um, and utilize for this, and I, I don't know if Nahoko is here, but I want to give her a shout out for uh, her work and Dr. Jeff Kimmer and myself really uh, spent a good amount of time with our SBS, SPSS uh, data mining and um, I appreciate the work that they both did on this as well. Uh, recommendation number six is an ongoing one that we are working on in the district in terms of looking at um, the frequency that substance use among teens shows up in our surveys and looking at ways uh, we've made some changes, but I, I know we all would like to do that more and to partner with others to see if there's a way we can make an impact in that particular area. So I sum all that up uh, with saying that the IAC has identified priorities for the 2021 school year. Um, Mr. Pirro has asked us to look at these and we've also agreed because of the outcomes of our climate survey that these would be the areas that we're working on looking at student relationships and how might we support the buildings in that effort, what ideas or suggestions, et cetera, that um, looking at access and outcomes for AP and honors courses and looking at discipline across the district um, and addressing anything that comes out of those reviews as well. So with that, I'd say thank you and open up for some questions. Okay, so there's a lot of questions. <laughs> I see that, 15. <laughs> um, so let me start. Um, I will read the question. Stop, sure. 
Yeah, and I I will read Peter the questions. <laughs> and um, whoever wrote the question, if you wanted to add or expand, please jump in. Yeah, um, and I, I have to go back to any slide, I'll do that. So the first one is from Laura. She says, she asked, was there a reason that the high school surveys weren't relaunched to include more of the population to get a higher response rates? Oh, good question. No, there was not a reason. Uh, we had a time period for the survey and when it closed, obviously it wasn't until after it closed that we knew of the um, lower response rate. And what we would do next year differently is really make that a part of something during the school day. We didn't do that for the high school students and sometimes the students don't want to do these types of things during the school day. But I, we definitely want to relook at that and, and do it differently next year to get a higher number of students participating. Thank you. We, uh, you know, we learned the lesson through this. Um, we deliver the youth risk behavior survey in the manner that we want now to deliver this one. So we, um, We've had strong partnerships, for example, with our PE classes and a couple of other classes at the high school where we devote that time to completing the surveys. And, you know, obviously we get a better response rate with that. So that is definitely on the docket. Um, the next one is from Victoria. Were the data presented as individual points that uncovered students provide, provided scores lower than a C? Yes, we looked at every single thing. And I could probably, I don't have it on this computer. I might be able to pull it up on another one. I didn't know what you'd be asking. I got two computers, <laughs> report, papers, <laughs> summaries. But um, I don't know if I have that one pulled up. We did do question um, analysis. And there were very, I don't even know if I can remember. I have to really look through to see if anything sticks out uh, to me for lower than that score. Um, I will look at that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just wanted to say the reason that I ask is because we know that there are some students that mm -hmm. have reported some highly unfavorable experiences mm -hmm. at school. And I just wanted to know if that was reflected in the survey. Yeah, and I'll take a look at that, Victoria. Okay. We also know this was a time in our district where there were some challenging things occurring um, as well. It, it doesn't jump out at me, but I don't want to say that definitively, so I'll take a look at that. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. And then, Tiffany, I think your question got split. So Tiffany first says thank you and then says, what is the smallest group size of data shown for groups with four or five students? Am I reading that correctly, Tiffany? Yeah, I just met. And thank you for showing those tables with the different- What do you think? Groups. Didn't they come out good? They <laughs> did. I, I was just curious if, um, like, what was the smallest, you know, like the indigenous population mm -hmm. or the non-binary? Was that um, one? Yeah, kids? Just there was like some small- Caution, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Just okay. as we caution about the comparatively low number of high school students you know, our largest number of students was in the middle school. But fortunately, we could take all that apart. But you're absolutely correct. Some of our smaller groups would be, um, I've got the data here for the high schools, I'd have to go in further to get the, the middle schools and the elementary, but our uh, non binary students were about 1%. So 1% would be about 19 students looking at the whole data set. Um, so that's the five to 12 um, data set. Um, okay. There was a total, I, did I tell you the total? The total was about, uh, I think it was on one of the slides. The total was uh, total response is about 2000 out of the potential enrollment of 3,800. So about 54% of the eligible students took the survey. But again, the difference between fifth graders, six to eight, nine to 12, 80% of elementary eligible, 82 middle and 26 high. But in looking at the uh, breakdown 
about, I figured about 19 students for each 1%, 18 maybe. All right. Um, so the next question comes from Jen. Has the staff ever been asked the climate survey questions about the student experience to see where their perceptions align with students' perceptions and where they diverge? Yes, I do not have that information with me. Somebody else is doing the staff, but yes, it's always interesting to look at. It's always interesting to look at staff to student comparisons um, and also parent to student, parent to staff to student to see where there's alignment or, or disagreement. Um, well, I guess not disagreement, but you know, differences to see. But yes, that's the IAC has talked about wanting to take a look at that too results of that and say what how does this compare or not compare to what students are doing or saying is that a part of the the youth risk behavior survey or am i making that up the youth risk behavior survey does not specifically ask parents okay. what the survey asks is the students mm -hmm. what do you think your, your parents, parents okay okay do you think your parents would think it's i know i'm paraphrasing do you think your parents would think it's okay to smoke cigarettes or um, smoke, to drink alcohol, to uh, use marijuana. And overall, the students report the most that uh, parents would not want them to smoke, but the using alcohol is pretty, is much lower than the others. So the student perception of their parents' concern, level of concern is much lower for alcohol than the other risk behaviors. We also this year, um, well, the last time student uh, youth risk behavior survey, we tried to get a sense of what students perceived their peers would think about those things. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty, it was similar. Um, okay, the next question comes from Victoria again. Um, did the students have an opportunity to provide written comments about what they thought might improve their experiences at school? No, not in this survey. Okay. Um, the next question from Jen is, were the findings listed strengths in all of the subgroups, race, religion, gender identity, et cetera? Uh, strength, they, um, we did comparisons. So I might have said, for example, um, our non-binary kids reported lower sco scores in all of the areas compared to those who identify as male or female, but then their lowest cohort uh, score was in mental health. So when we looked at it, we did do a uh, comparison within the group as well as comparing to the others in that category. So we looked at religion and might said something about, you know, this religion, people who um, identify as part of this religion said this higher or lower. And then we also looked at the lowest one within each of those categories, to try to see if there was any real patterns for that. The overall patterns were really the things that related to the, what you would guess are some of the mental health things, that sense of having relationships with peers. Um, those were the ones that, that stuck out. Um, the next question was from Mark. Um, can you provide a list of individual questions and their outcomes in the future? Can I provide a list of individual questions? What kind, how, how are the outcomes? Like the individual survey questions and what the outcomes were for the individual questions? Across categories or I'm just trying to get a sense. So I think a category has yeah. a set of questions within mm -hmm. it and you're kind of aggregating up the category off the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just not understanding like what the what the original questions that mm -hmm. that category look like and and Ben just asking, is there mm -hmm. can can statistical data be provided mm -hmm. on the individual question mm -hmm. themselves? Yeah, I have that. Yeah, we did look Yeah, I was gonna say I think that's appendix A in that packet that you gave us at <laughs> IAC. <laughs> And it was also one of the parts of one of the early presentations. I don't know if you were on yeah. that. So we have looked at the question level, the domain element level, the domain level, the school level, 
on all of those. And sometimes having the conversation, it was good to go back to the question. Um, again, recognizing that we all might read that somewhat the same or somewhat differently, um, but just having an understanding of um, how the students responded to that particular question. And we do have that. Um, next question from Victoria. Is there a role for healing circles for building peer-to-peer -peer relationships? That's question one. And then the second one says, you mentioned Generation Ready. Are there specific program activities planned for the students? Yes, and there will be. Um, we have, we use um, community circles quite a bit in the, in the district and have found great success for those, not only in um, relationship building, which they're very important to do from a proactive perspective, as, but as well as when there are issues or concerns among individuals, we use that as well. And we've done um, also in relationship to our current circumstances, helping kids to understand what's going on and what we can control and what we can't control and how to address some of those types of things. So we're very much into doing that. What was the second part? Oh, we're generation ready. Right. Right. So once again, that's another item that was uh, COVID paused, but Natalie was back with uh, the administrative group, I'm going to say two or three weeks ago, and we'll be back. My kids, the schedule that I don't have it offhand. Um, and we will be completing uh, her walkthroughs as well as she'll be working with us on each of the plans for the buildings and the levels. Her Thank you. Victoria's question also was directed towards generation doing any program or activities for the students. Um, I don't know if that's on the docket right now. It was something we talked about, mm -hmm. but now we're regrouping and back together again. It was really nice to have her involved again. Very nice. Um, Victoria, do you have anything to add to that or? Well, I was just kind of curious about the healing circles or communication circles, because I know that at like certain campuses, um, there was an emphasis placed on that. So were those types of activities happening, I know pre-COVID, kind of across all of the campuses? I would say most of them. Pre-COVID, we had completed having at least one a uh, staff member at each building complete the training as a trainer through PERI. And we were prepping for our second round of people to do that so that we had okay. more than one person actually there. So we're rekindling our relationship with PERI. Um, and certainly we have people across the district who are, are trained, but we have actually one trainer per building. We really want more than that. Okay, thank you. We also have a lot of individuals in the district who have done their own learning and training. They have not gone through the train the trainer process, uh, which is a more intensive process, but um, very familiar. And, and sometimes too, that's all different names for this. Sometimes um, teachers are doing community building circles, which is called the morning meeting, or sometimes they're doing community building circles that are called something else, but we've really encouraged people to do something that builds that community at the start of the day or the morning or however they're going to do that. Um, some of the resources we're providing for the building, so we've sent out resources to our secondary buildings listing all types of ways. For example, um, to use homeroom. How can you use those 10 minutes of homeroom to build community? What types of activities can be readily available to teaching staff to build community among our students uh, at the middle and high school level during those um, nine or 10 minutes in the morning when there's the, the homeroom. Okay, great, thanks for that. Sure. Um, so the next one comes from Mark again. It says, um, it's difficult if, I know it's, it is difficult if impossible to complete, compete. What? Across, go ahead, Mark. You read it. Why don't I? I read. I reread it, and I realized that it was just really grammatical. It was a trick question. <laughs> I know. I was like, wait, what? No. I know. Uh, so I know it's like very difficult to compare across surveys, 
uh, different types of surveys, but I did notice that there, while well, I was looking over the youth, uh, the youth risk behavior survey, and you can see certain mm-hmm. trends there across different grade levels and in similar areas, the, the, at least in terms of how they're, you know, the areas are classified. So you right. see um, some cyberbullying and bullying similarities. I mm-hmm. at least see kind of shapes that look the same in the data. Yeah. Or in the in the tables, mm-hmm. um, do you are you how are you are you looking to to, to use these uh, in the future and how and or stop using one and start using another or just continue to run both of them at the same time? I'd really like to see us, between them that are interesting. Yes, well, to me that's interesting. So I would like to do that. I'm probably not the final decision maker on that. Um, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey gives us the opportunity really to compare ourselves to our neighboring districts as well as the county. So we look at where we are in comparison to everyone else in the county and everybody participates, all the districts participate. Um, So I really like that and it's part of really national data that we can look at uh, that originated through the CDC and is done all across the country. So I I like that because we, and we have a strong history of that. Now questions have changed, et cetera. So we have to just be mindful of that, but it really cuts across all the risk areas. And when we think about um, trauma and work around ACEs, that really gives us the detail that I think we'd want to make sure we track. Um, well, we thought this Department of Ed survey was not the perfect survey. I don't know if there is a perfect survey. I think this allowed us to get at the relationships more so than the youth risk behavior survey does. So the youth risk really hones in on those risk behaviors, um, early sexual activity, drinking, uh, driving with drugs or alcohol, et cetera. Whereas I see this one as a little bit more of, you know, how do you feel your relationships are with the people that you are with for seven hours a day? And I think that's an important component of trying to really deal with the mental health component of our work and the social emotional component of our work. So I'd like to see us continue those. And I think they're um, not the same, but I think they're complementary. So what's interesting this year is the youth risk behavior survey should be done this year. It's done every two years, Um, but the group has determined that they're not going to, they're going to wait. Um, so I'm hoping that the IAC and makes a recommendation to the superintendent that we do this one again this year so that we can begin to develop a look at data that extends over time. What's nice about being able to do these and again back to youth risk or this is that we're able to look at the cohorts of kids so that you know the kids that took the youth risk behavior survey uh, in 2019 uh, as freshmen, uh, in theory, we're going to be juniors this spring, so we could have watched them go from freshmen to juniors and and take a look at the data that way. Where's it? How's this cohort that we've seen from seventh graders to ninth graders to eleventh graders, and what's ch- changed or different in their responses? And while students move in and out of the district, it's not such a large N that we'd have to worry about that they're completely different kids. So there's a strong stability in that look at seventh grade, ninth grade, 11th grade, or eighth grade, 10th grade, 12th grade, so that we can look at the the patterns of when their responses change um, and maybe target some more of of what we want to do. And and that's what happens, for example, in health classes and things like that. We look at that data and they might target um, social norming activities related to what, what we've seen in those trends for the cohorts. Um, so I'm going to skip Victoria's question because it's uh, the con- the low level of high school student survey participation, and I think we spoke about that a few times. Um, mm-hmm. The next one from Linda was, "Will the PowerPoint be available?" Um, yes. <laughs> and yeah, just don't just don't show them recording. That's what I don't like. That's what that I was like. We recorded. I said I hate being recorded. <laughs> I'm doing what I can with screenshots and typing. And- no, yes, definitely. I got to clean up just a couple little things that aren't right, but then I'll send it over to you. Okay. Great. And, 
<laughs> and then Annalise asks, um, was the survey done anonymously? Was there time to follow up on the red flag reporters, the 11th and 12th graders who completed it, aren't even in high school anymore since this was April 2019? Yes, it's anonymous. So in terms of following up with any individual or particular student, no. But in being able to look more globally at the school or grade level, yes. The same thing with the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And we do look at it for, um, sometimes I talk to the students and who, who's got high schoolers in here? Has anybody got high schoolers in here? Okay. So I talk sometimes to the students and they say, oh my gosh, no one answers that truthfully. Everybody puts down, yes, I do this all the time. I do this all the time, I do that all the time, I do this all the time, I do that all the time. But when we look at the data and we factor out for those types of responses, we can see that yes, somebody put that they do, uh, drink every day, they have relations every day, they do this every day. And I will tell you that it's a couple of students. Mm -hmm. So we can factor that out, we can see that in the responses and we can factor that out. And even if you look at plus or minus 3%, from a survey perspective, our kids are just so good. They really answer these, even though I think they want to say they don't really do it. But I'm going to tell you this consistency. Um, every time I look at a survey, particularly for that one, and when we improve our rates on this one, is that um, you know if I look at it over that seventh, ninth grade, eleventh grade, or whatever, you know, it's like six, seven thousand answers to these questions. So it gives me a little bit of confidence in um, the reliability of the data after we factor out um, kids that don't answer or kids that answer all affirmatively or all negatively. Um, so the last question from Jen is, it says not climate survey related, but do you know when the generation ready reports and recommendations will be shared with the community, in particular, the parent fo focus group feedback? No, I do not. But I can, I can ask Mike. I mean, I know he knows more than I do, but I can, I can ask him. I know she's, uh, I'm going to say she's coming back again in the relative near future, but I'll check that out for you. I gotta make my list. You're gonna give me all these questions. <laughs> right? um, we we can, yes. <laughs> okay. Mark's the tech guy, so I'm sure he can. Yeah. <laughs> sure, I'll share off this over to you. Okay. Um. All right. So, anybody have any other questions? Because those were our list of. I wow. Know. <laughs> wow. That was good. That was good. Um. We really appreciate it, Dr. Brogan. I know you had to rearrange some things to make That's it okay. tonight. That's um, okay. You know, I really appreciate that you were I'm happy to be that. here. I'm excited about the level of interest yes. in this. So, um, you know, this this particular thing has come through the IAC. So that uh, is yep. a rep on there. So keep those kinds of things coming. Um, but certainly my office handles these types of things. So if you have other questions, just let me know or shoot me an email or something of that nature. Um, so I do, like I said, I thank you so much for that. Um, I know we had a workshop last week with uh, Mrs. Barker on hidden bias and microaggressions, yeah. which was really good. Um, and I wanna just quickly announce that December 8th from 6 to 9 p.m., Dr. Case, We'll be doing, um, we just got it finalized today. <laughs> um, she's going to be doing the cultural competency and she's gonna actually, I know last time we talked, there was two modules that we were all interested in. And, um, it was defining and understanding respect against across culture and implications in the community, as well as race as a social construct, race versus ethnicity and the impact on identity. So she's mm -hmm. actually going to mix the two for us and do a presentation on the 8th from 6 to 9 p.m. Um, Great. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, and, you know, we will send out another Facebook invite. Um, it's probably going to be another registered one. Um, but depending on our numbers, we'll open it up near the, when it gets closer to that. 
Um, I wonder if sometime maybe you want to do something, or maybe you've done it already on the whole community circle, the restorative circle. Uh, yeah, we could definitely do yeah. one on that too. Um, it hasn't, you know, we haven't done one on that yet. Um, but you know, we're we're trying. <laughs> we're trying yeah. to do something every month. So. That's great. That's <laughs> terrific. I think it's um, terrific. So yeah, so we, we can definitely do look into that as well. Um, and I know the town we you know we're we're planning on participating with the town for the MLK stuff. But I know I spoke to Kevin briefly, and that's still in the planning works. I know Kevin Beckford is on this call. I don't know if he's busy or able to speak, but um, I know we were in the process of trying to get together and plan something with that as well. So there's a few things in the works. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'll say goodbye, but thank you very Bye. much thank for so having much. me tonight. I really appreciate it. Yes. Take care. Have a good one. See you. Thank Bye. You.